Howdy. Howdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bush Library Center. It gives me great pleasure to uh, greet you here today for the opening of our fall program, beginning with the Bank of America program on volunteerism. And tonight we're featuring Jenna Bush, daughter of President George W. Bush and Laura Bush, and best-selling author of Anna's Story. Ms. Bush will be uh, delivering a lecture on, based on that book, and I think it's gonna be quite an exciting event for everyone that's attending here. We can tell that this is gonna be a very good event by the simple fact that we already have an overflow crowd. So I would say to the people in the auditorium adjoining this one to please stay seated, because after Jenna's finished in here, she will visit with you and the president and have a few words of ex in exchange with that audience in auditorium B. Uh, I owe special thanks to a number of people here tonight. First of all, I'd like to thank the Bank of America uh, for its support of this program. Their endowment makes it possible. And to representing the bank today are a number of representatives headed by Mr. Ken uh, Wilson, who is the... Uh, Ken is the president for Central and South Texas for Bank of America, and he's accompanied by Nikki Salcillo and Kathleen Lee Ford. Fort Smith, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kathleen Fort Smith. In addition, joining us tonight is the president of Texas A&M University, Dr. Ed Davis, <laughs> accompanied by his lovely wife, Joanne. Joanne. Following Jenna's presentation, I ask that all of you join us in the lobby. There will be a book signing in room 1011B, and you'll be directed in that direction afterwards. But those of you who would like to pick up a copy of the book, it's a best-selling book, I tell you. Uh, you can do so after the event. And by the way, it makes a great Christmas present, so do your Christmas shopping early. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to call upon the 41st President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in a warm welcome for President George Bush. much. Thank you. Thank you all. Please be seated. <clears throat> you know, this is the first time that I've ever had the opportunity to introduce one of my grandkids to a huge crowd like this. And I view it as a big honor, and I view it as a treat. Uh, Jenna is one of two came roughly the same time. Her, her sister, Barbara, is one minute older than Jenna is. And, uh, but Jenna's gone on to do wonderful things in life. And of course, uh, I am so very proud of her, as is Barbara, uh, for this book, Anna's Story. Anna's Story will be number one on the New York Times bestseller list this coming Sunday, I think. Uh, and it's uh, in the ch 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 children's list, but it's a very mature and moving story uh, that I have read, that Barbara's read some time ago, and I know that you'll enjoy it. It's an important book. It talks about HIV AIDS, and it talks about what you can do to understand uh, the enormity of the problems with it. Uh, Jenna lived this, this with these people. She knows, stays in touch, or has stayed in touch with Anna. Uh, she's, uh, she really has this in her heart, as you will see when she talks. Um, it's a moving book. The proceeds go to UNICEF for the Children's Fund, uh, and some of the money from the, this fund goes directly to support the child who is the subject of the book. And uh, to say that Barbara and I are extraordinarily proud of Jenna, uh, that's the classic understatement of the year. So with no further ado, my granddaughter, Jenna Bush. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, that's so sweet. It, it almost made me cry. <laughs> but I'm very excited to be in College Station and to be at the George, George W, heard it too many times, <laughs> the Bush Presidential Library Center. I haven't been here since 
Um, I was a little girl and it looks beautiful and I heard that it's under renovation and there are gonna be some new exhibits um, up soon. So I, I wish that I could have taken a look. But thank you so much, Gampy. Um, he's President Bush to most of you, but to me, he's just plain Gampy. And I love him so much. And um, thank you for inviting me here to your beautiful library. And of course, I have to thank my grandmother. And um, she's a strong woman. And she's definitely taught my sister and me some great lessons about how to be strong women. And we admire you so much. Um, thank you also to Bank of America for hosting this. And I think um, your series on volunteerism is very important and I appreciate it. And of course, President Davis of Texas and A&M A University. I went to the rival school, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh no, people hissed at me earlier today. <laughs> I went to, I spoke today at Bryan High School and I got hissed at before I even got on the stage. <laughs> um, but um, I admire your university a lot, but don't tell any Texas fans. <laughs> and of course, all of the staff at the Presidential Library, thank you so much for having me here to the biggest crowd I've seen yet. So thanks so much. And I'm here to speak with you about Anna's story. And more importantly, to have the chance to talk with you about Anna and the other amazing kids and teenagers I met during my stay in Latin America. After teaching at a great charter school in Washington, D.C., my third and fifth grade students, many of whom immigrated from the Latin America region, from Mexico, Peru, Nicaragua, El Salvador, inspired me to learn more about their countries and their cultures. As I spoke with my students and their parents about their original schools and countries, I wanted to learn more. So I moved to Panama and worked for UNICEF an amazing organization that helps kids in more than 150 countries around the world. I learned to love writing and reading from my own teachers and professors. So my job for UNICEF was to travel around Latin America to Panama, Argentina, Paraguay, and Jamaica, meeting kids of all ages. I met with them, heard their stories of hope and resilience. After I listened to the details of their lives, I wrote their stories or their historias de vidas for UNICEF. I moved to Latin America with one of my best friends and a very gifted photographer. I always look for her and never can find her. And she took the beautiful pictures of these kids that accompanied their stories and then ended up um, the exquisite photos in Anna's story. And she's here today somewhere, although I don't see her. Oh, in the way back. <laughs> Sorry, Mia, she gets so embarrassed. But um, <laughs> thanks for coming, Mia. The children and teenagers we met have very hard lives. They are living in extreme poverty. They are HIV positive. They don't have access to education or medical care. And they live in very dangerous situations and homes. And UNICEF tries to give them better futures. But all the kids we met are living with so much hope. They have the same dreams as many of us. They wanna graduate from high school, live in a safe home, go to college, and someday have families. Let me tell you about two particular teenagers who inspired me. Mia and I worked with UNICEF Argentina in Buenos Aires in an after-school program called La Casa Galilea. La Casa Galilea works in Villa Cava, or Cave City a slum near one of the most affluent parts of Buenos Aires. It was disheartening to witness the massive economic gap. Beautiful houses five minutes from shanties made of tin and cloth. Pools next to an area with no running water. Every day we would drive past grand haciendas covered in ivy and then stop at a wall that is patrolled by armed police. Behind the wall is the largest slum in Buenos Aires, where 10,000 people live in extreme poverty. Through La Casa Galilea, Mia and I met a charismatic 15-year-old boy named Juan. Juan was forced to drop out of school when he was 12 and work in the streets to make money for his mom and his nine other brothers and sisters. He walked on his hands and performed other tr tricks in front of cars that drive past him for spare change. 
He went three years without opening a book, three years without playing soccer with his friends, and three years without solving a single math problem. But now with UNICEF help, and obviously the support of La Casa Galilea, I am proud to say that Juan is back in school. During my time working with UNICEF, I also met an incredible 17-year-old girl named Anna. Anna changed my life. She is only 17, but she has lived a life of someone so much older. She has lived an extremely difficult life. She was infected with HIV at birth. She is an orphan. Her mom, dad, and sister all died from AIDS when she was a young girl. She has been shuffled around most of her life. She has been abused, beaten, and abandoned by the people that she trusted the most. And she was forced to drop out of school when at 16 years old, she had her baby Beatrice. Anna it was so generous in telling me about her life. She wanted to tell her story so that other kids could learn from her experiences and know that they have the right to protect themselves. She wanted kids in the United States to be educated about the illness that she is living with and know the facts about HIV. Most importantly, she wanted to share her story so that we all would be inspired to make a difference, to help girls and boys like her in our schools and communities and around the world. And she wanted me to tell you that if you know a child like Anna here in the United States, they should know they are not alone and it's okay to get the help they need to keep themselves safe. Despite her hardships, Anna is so much like teenagers here in the United States. And in fact, she reminds me of how I was at 17. <laughs> she loves to dance the bachata, and she taught me how to dance it. She likes to listen to Shakira and reggae music, and she loves spending time with her friends. Now I would like to share a little bit of Anna's story with you. One, Anna had one picture of her mother. It was not an original photograph, but a color photocopy. The image had been laminated, sealed in plastic for protection so that it would last forever. When she was 10, Anna decorated the corners with sparkly stickers of flowers and stars. She handled the photocopy so often that the corners had started to curl and the plastic had begun to fray and come apart. All of her life, Anna's aunts and uncles told her that she looked just like her mama. Anna sometimes stood in front of the mirror holding the photocopy next to her face. She wanted to see if her eyes were really the same as her mother's. Anna shifted her focus from her eyes to her mother's eyes until the images blurred and she could not tell where her mother ended and she began. In the photocopy, Anna's mother was young. She was only 16 when Anna was born. She had big brown eyes and feathers of dyed blonde hair. Her skin, the color of cocoa, looked fresh, smooth, and polished. Anna hoped her family was right. She hoped she looked like her beautiful mama. Anna's mother had been gone for so long that Anna could only recall the curves of her face by looking at the ragged photocopy. Anna taped the picture to the wall of her bedroom at Pillow Height so that she could stare at it before she went to sleep, comforted in knowing that if she ever forgot what her mother looked like, she could glance over and remember. Two, Anna had only one actual memory of her mother. It was not vivid, but vague and somewhat confusing. She remembered this piece of her past like a black and white movie, the images blurred and out of focus beyond reach. In the memory, Anna's first, she was three years old. She stood in the hallway outside a bathroom. Her mother was on the other side of the door, sobbing and wailing. Mama, Anna whispered through the wooden door. Are you okay? She could hear her mother crying then trying to catch her breath. Mama, Anna put her hand on the knob and turned it. She pulled open the door and peeked inside. Her mother leaned against the wall with one hand and turned and looked at Anna through puffy red eyes. Her mother's hand trembled and she, reaped up, she reached up to wipe the tears that streamed down her cheeks. Anna, her father said from down the hall, leave Mama alone, por favor. Anna felt confused and afraid. Her papa's eyes were also red and he too had been crying. Your sister Lucia, he started then stopped. He drew a deep breath and then said quickly, your sister has died. Anna heard the words, but she didn't really understand. She was too young to comprehend the meaning of death and grief. 
all she saw was that Mama and Papa were crying, and that made her uneasy and afraid. Okay, Anna whispered, backing away from the door. She knew that her mother had gone to the hospital and given birth to her youngest sister in the summertime. She knew that Lucia was sick and that her mother had come home without the baby. My mom went to see Lucia at the hospital every morning, but always returned home alone. Anna never met her baby sister, and now she never would. Lucia died when she was two months old. Lucia's three. Lucia's death was Anna's first secret. During her first days of school, Anna and her classmates marched like sailors, wearing the mandatory school uniforms of her country, white blouses and navy pants or skirts. When anyone asked, do you have any brothers or sisters? She usually responded, yes, I have one sister, Isabel, and she looks exactly like me. Anna considered the resp response truthful, if incomplete. She willingly and openly spoke about Isabel, who was not yet in school because she was two years younger, but she didn't want to talk about Lucia's life. Lucia's life was like a dream, disconnected and private. Four, when friends asked about her family, Anna talked about her life as if it belonged to someone else. She recited the facts like the poem she memorized at school, but so many memories were missing that her past was like Swiss cheese filled with holes. Mama died when I was three, Anna told anyone who asked where her mother was. This was true, but in the place where childhood memories belong, Anna had nothing, a void. She only repeated what her family members told her about her mama. Anna didn't remember mama growing weak and pale in the months after Lucia's death. She didn't remember mama's face becoming gaunt and skeletal. She didn't remember her mama's breathing becoming labored and slow, the pause between breaths growing longer and longer until her breathing stopped. Anna's mama was not yet 20 when she died of AIDS. She was sick, Anna told those who pressed for more information. With what? Aunt, with what? I don't know, Anna replied. It was the truth, because that's all she would know for many years. Five, and then, and it gets a little bit more hopeful. I feel like the, the first chapters are pretty sad. Um, so I may want to skip to a chapter where it does, because especially right now, I feel like it's very sad in the somber. Um, okay. So seven, secrets didn't matter when Anna was with her papa. During the week he drove a taxi, but on Sundays he drove from his apartment through the slums of the city to Abuela's house to pick up Anna and Isabel in the afternoon. Papa, where are we going? Anna asked, as she did every time she and Isabel climbed into the back seat of the faded blue taxi. On an adventure, Miss Ethath, he always replied. With Papa, everything was always an adventure. On their outings, they usually went shopping or to the movies, or if the girls were very lucky, to McDonald's for hamburgers, french fries, and chicken strips. When the weather was good, Papa would take them to the docks, where they would stare at the tankers and smaller fishing bo boats moving into and out of the bay. Papa praised his daughters. Te amo, he whispered to each of the girls, telling them, I love you, making them feel invincible and safe. While she loved shopping and going to the movies, for Anna, the most magical part of the evening was when the setting sun painted the skyline a fiery gold and the street band set up on the sidewalks. When the music started, Papa and his daughter would pause on the street corner by one of the bands and start swinging their arms and stepping in time to the music. Anna's heart beat in rhythm with the salsa and the reggae drums. The energy of the music pulsed through her body before long, all three, Papa, Anna, and Isabel, fell under the music spell, surrendering to the dance. These times spent dancing with her Papa were among Anna's most cherished moments. So there's about a hundred more, but they're very short. <laughs> you may be asking yourself, what does Anna's story have to do with me? But how many of us know kids like Anna? Kids who are scared and sad. Kids who feel alone. Kids who need help. Anna represents the 2.3 million children around the world who are living with HIV AIDS and the millions more who face abuse in their house or in their schools. I met Anna and dozens of other children who are living with HIV or facing abuse. 
I was able to hear their stories firsthand. I hope this video I'm about to show you makes the lives, hardships, and hopes of these kids as real to you as they are to me. So roll the video, please. Most of us in the United States have the basics we need to survive and grow. We have food and clean water. We get health care when we're sick and immunizations to prevent us from getting illnesses. And we can go to school to learn with our teachers and have fun with our friends. But not all young people in the world get to do these things. Some have to work in dangerous jobs. Some live in places where there's war. Some get sick because there's no doctor when they need one. Some don't live anywhere near safe, clean water. And some live alone because their parents have died of AIDS. All of us everywhere need the same things to survive and grow. But some kids live in places where poverty or violence or natural disasters make it difficult to get even the basics. What happens to these kids is hard to even think about. 10 million kids die every year. One out of every four kids is undernourished. 115 million kids are not in school. 126 million kids work in dangerous jobs. These numbers can make us feel sad, angry, even powerless. But the fact is, there's a lot we can do. There's an organization called UNICEF that helps kids all over the world. UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, has been helping children survive for over 60 years and has more than 7,000 women and men working in over 150 countries to provide health care, clean water, nutrition, and education to the kids who need it the most. Among the regions where UNICEF has life-saving programs are Latin America and the Caribbean. That's where I worked as an intern for eight months, and my job was to document the stories of children and mothers whose lives were a constant struggle because of poverty, isolation, and disease. I will never forget the courageous, resourceful people I met. There's Elisa, the HIV-positive mother of four whose husband had died of AIDS. Elisa spoke to me of how her seven-year-old daughter has inherited the virus and is very sick. Elisa's heart is breaking about her little girl, but this brave woman, with UNICEF's help, has kept herself as strong and healthy as possible by educating herself and taking life-extending medication called ARVs. And Elisa has worked with UNICEF to keep her youngest child, one-year-old Siama, healthy and safe from the virus by participating in a UNICEF-supported program to prevent the transmission of HIV from mother to child. <laughs> then there's Jimenez a 15-year-old boy who had to walk four hours each day to get to school and back. Jimenez is so intent on getting an education that he pays for his own school tuition, books, and supplies by working clearing out patches of jungle with his machete. He dreams of becoming a doctor and helping the people of his impoverished neighborhood. And of course, there's Anna. Anna's mother died of AIDS when Anna was very small. And for much of her childhood, she has lived a life of neglect, abuse, and isolation. HIV positive herself, Anna is now the teen mother of baby Beatrice and is determined to make a better life for herself and her child. With the UNICEF-assisted program giving her baby care, Anna can now go back to school and get the education she has always dreamed of 
An education that will help her break the cycle of poverty, illness, and abuse she has struggled with throughout her young life. The one thing that was really driven home to me during my time working with UNICEF is that no matter where we live or who we are, people all over the world want pretty much the same things. We all want health, safety, some basic comforts, and the chance to live, learn, be part of a loving family and community, and grow up to be productive, happy adults. Every child in the world deserves to have a childhood like this. And all of us need to work together to make sure that every kid gets one. <laughs> so after watching that video, you may be asking yourself, how could I make a difference? What could I possibly do? And the answer is so much. Get educated about HIV AIDS, abuse, or any other causes that are important to you by researching them online or in your local library. You can even come to this library. And Anna and all of the other kids, if you noticed in the pictures, Anna's face was never showed because um, she faces um, much discrimination. Kids living with HIV in Latin America couldn't be hurt or kicked out of school or treated badly. Um, and the reason why they face this discrimination is because people are not educated about HIV AIDS. You can't catch HIV from sitting close to someone or sharing someone's lunch or holding hands or hugging. So know the difference between the myths and the facts about HIV, AIDS, and abuse, and open up a dialogue in your family, community, or schools. Make a difference in your own community by becoming a mentor, tutoring a student, or volunteering for an organization like UNICEF. Giving money is also great, because UNICEF really knows how to make each, the most out of each dollar. One thing I'm very excited about that you can encourage your young students or, or kids or grandkids to do is trick or treat for UNICEF. Um, we're traveling this fall when we go to schools. I'll also bring orange boxes so that kids can go out and trick or treat for UNICEF because although a couple dollars change to us isn't that much, it can really um, make the difference between kids getting the medicine they need to stay healthy and, and the food they need to stay nourished. So learn more about UNICEF if you want and how you can help go to www.unicef.org. And I know many of you are already making a huge difference in your own communities and around the world. So thank you so much. I wanna thank you very much for having me here tonight. And I hope I didn't talk too long. <laughs> And I'll see some of you, hopefully, in the book signing. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>